We are live and recording. And um, I think we'll start in about, we'll give, we'll give it about a minute for people to, sh to filter it. They come in uh, and we'll start. It may just be us, but we're recording it. So maybe some people will watch it in the future. Mm -hmm. All right. So people will get started. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, Welcome to the Horasis Global Meeting session on philosophy, how does it fit modern life and the future? We'll be hearing from a variety of different perspectives on this and related questions. Our first speaker today is Clive Pizot. Pizot is a professor of aesthetics in the School of Art and Design at Cardiff Falls University in Wales. He works in the continental tradition broadly across the philosophies of art and the senses and is the author of books on the philosophies of metaphor and artistic research. He's currently writing a book on the aesthetics of audio drama. I'll turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Justin, for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. So yeah, looking at the, the panel outline, some, some really big questions about um, the place of philosophy after the pandemic. Uh, whether the philosopher is immune from the to the or from the ravages of life, and and the good life, um, and then um, there's quite big concepts like modern life. Um, what do one does mean by that? Modern life for whom? Uh, the wealthy, the impoverished, uh, victims of war, and then philosophy. You know, which, which philosophy does one pick? It has many guises in the world. Uh, metaphysics, the, the theory of everything, uh, skepticism, you know, a form of radical doubt, uh, a method of thinking, of, of questioning, of being clear about concepts, and, and also you know, provocation, a way of trying to rattle us or shake us from our conventional ways of thinking. And, 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 and there's many more. So how can we, where do we, how do we bring these broad ideas to a focus? Um, I'd like to, um, I suppose, focus on perhaps some of the problems around the modern and perhaps the that sense of the modern self that, that, that in the West we, I suppose, have developed since Descartes, um, the idea of I think, therefore I am, uh, this idea of everything focusing on the subject, on the self, uh, which is arguably reinforced by capitalism, you know, per capita, per head, uh, acquisition of wealth, and and reinforced by by image technologies uh, and with uh, platforms like YouTube, TikTok, um, what have you. And I want to suggest uh, uh, a response or an alternative to this way of thinking of the self that I think um, can uh, address many of the problems of, of that notion of, of subject-centeredness. And it's, um, it comes from a branch of philosophy called phenomenology. And it's the idea of ourselves as embodied, located, immersed beings within an environment uh, acted upon by others and who acts upon others. And if one was to perhaps try and summarize that alternative theory of the self, it would be what I call an incomplete self or an open self. We're, we're not units, we're not things, we're always immersed, engaged and open. And if there's a practice that uh, embodies that, it would be be listening. So what? Do, why do I think this idea is important, this idea of our open embodied self located within situations in which we act with or upon others? 
Um, I think it has an, a number of positive qualities. It makes us more fully aware of, of the beings who are present and what is available. And by beings or by others, I mean people, animals, organisms. And it doesn't just give us a list of, of what's available. It helps us to grow our ecological awareness, the fact that we are as selves, we are enabled by other things, a body, a voice, a language, a community. And by, by one pra the practice, how does one practice this kind of being? As I say, it's perhaps uh, openness and listening. And this is in contrast to perhaps the idea of a dominating will or an ego or, or even greed. And what do I mean by listening? It's perhaps recognizing that, there's, that in every situation there's a complex of forces and it's being attentive to perhaps the way those forces are acting and how I as a self might want to align or position myself in relation to those forces. And it, I think finally it makes us more attentive to the senses and what the senses give to thought and as a way of preventing thought from becoming too abstract. Uh, this is an idea we get very much from, from Kant who argues that you know, thought can run into difficulties when it's not when it's removed from sensory engagement. Um, and, and finally, just to give um, perhaps illustrations of that practice in relation to my own life, and I work as a philosopher in higher education, uh, in, in my writing, I'm thinking not so much you know, what do I want to say, but what does my reader need? What's going to make this topic meaningful for a reader, for another? And in what I'm saying, what might the implications be for others in the field and for other subjects, for other people beyond this subject. And in my teaching, uh, increasingly, uh, certainly with the pandemic, uh, what do my students need in order to feel confident to speak? Uh, I'm sure we've all had experiences of online seminars where students are there or are reluctant to talk. How, what, what, are the what are the preconditions for allowing someone to speak? And how can I respond to what a student says to develop their understanding, to draw out what's in them uh, so that their understanding enlarges and they feel that they are contributing to a, a greater whole? Great. So place of philosophy in the modern world, um, the open human being who listens. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Clive. Appreciate that. Um, we'll hear from everyone briefly and then we'll have time for questions among us and from the audience as well. Um, up next, we're hearing from Professor Eva Kate, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Stony Brook University, formerly student Stony Brook. She works in feminist philosophy, feminist ethics, social and political theory, metaphor, disability studies. She's the author of many works, including most recently the book, Learning from My Daughter, The Value and Care of Disabled Minds. Uh, Professor Kate. Um, do you unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Clive, this, and thank you all. And Clive, this fits very well uh, with what you were just talking about. So um, I'm going to <clears throat> run through this, and uh, I may not get through it all. Uh, John Dewey wrote, uh, when women who are not mere students of other, pe other persons' philosophy set out to write it, we cannot conceive that it will be the same in viewpoint or tenor as that composed from the standpoint of the different masculine experience of things. Dewey may have said the same of philosophers of color, LGBTQ, disabled philosophers, and those at the intersections of these different identities. All have brought unique perspectives, have added to the data base um, of what philosophers need to think about and rethink. And they, by large, uh, turned away from our kind philosophy that's dominated the Anglo-American scene since the rise, at least the rise of logical positivism, 
and brought new life, vibrancy, and purpose into the discipline. The women philosophers have brought something into the discipline that is arguably not a footnote to Plato, as Whitehead insisted all philosophy is fated to be. However, as a moral orientation, it's been with us forever, though philosophers have given it scarcely a glance. That old and new thing is an ethics of care, a fruit of which do we forecast. Care is generally thought to be that which we give to one or a few people at a time, mostly in a domestic or intimate setting. But how is it an ethical ideal, and how can it help us transform philosophy and address the panel question of how philosophy can help people critically outthink negatives and live a good life? As one explores what constitutes good care in even confined settings of the domestic sphere, a hospital bedside, one comes to see a conception of self that differs from what David Gautier called an independent center of activity, one whose cares are primarily his own. Instead, it's a self <clears throat> that brackets one's own needs and desires and attends to another, a self that sees itself always in relation to others as well as to itself. An ethic of care takes reason off its throne as the arbiter of good and right and gives emotions such as love, empathy, sympathy, their due. It recognizes that moral interactions can be asymmetric without being domineering and that universal rules and maxims must bend to the particularity and context of the cared for and the relations of care. Furthermore, to succeed as care, carers must aim to meet the other's needs as the care for understands their own good and flourishing. Care that is not respectful of another's aspirations, which impose a set of values not accepted by the cared for, fails to be care um, that is taken up by the cared for and so falls short of care as it ought to be done. Care, I, I speak of it in the normative sense. The ethic of care holds together a tripart conception of care as at once a labor, an attitude, or disposition, and a virtue. Uh, such <clears throat> as such, it aims never to be achieved solely in the personal interaction of care and cared for. It exceeds these parameters in a number of ways that are internal to the labor and true to the attitude and virtue of care. First, if we regard care as so important that we set aside our own desires, wants, and needs, we have to see that care is not only a value in this situation, but a good for all. We each need care at some point in our lives if we are to survive our periods of inevitable dependency, illness, infancy, some disabilities, frail old age, and thrive as persons. When an ethic of care takes a, a care as a, an ethic takes care as its central good and our ability to care as a fundamental moral power, then it propels us to foster a world where all receive the care they need and when and how they need it. All can exercise their moral powers to care. That is to say, we care about care itself. Second, we care for another our own, uh, as we care for another, our own wants and needs we become derivatively dependent on others to help us meet our needs. The hospital nurse who at the start of the pandemic wore plastic bags were failed by their employers and their government who did not provide what they need to keep themselves and their patients safe and well cared for. We see that we are always situated in nested dependencies an ethic of care quickly becomes a politics of care. The demand that arises is for a social responsibility to support relations of care. Third, an ethic of care demands a conception of equity, an unequal distribution of caring labor and the inequities in who gets the care they need are based on what Isabel Wilkerson calls the caste system. Those in the lower caste care for those in higher castes. This has been everywhere so with respect to the gender of hierarchy, with the hierarchy of gender and in the United States with respect to people of color. To break down these hierarchies, we need to 
adequately reward the labor of care. We need to cultivate the skills and the desire to care, to elevate the labor of care so that it is no longer characterized by a precarity. And we go already a long distance in establishing a more equal society, one less painful and full of uh, negativity. Okay. For, uh, okay. I, you were a bit over, so I, I, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, think, uh, I didn't maybe hear the bell. During the discussion, we can okay. elaborate a bit more. But thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> uh, uh, up next, we're hearing from Jill Marston. Uh, Jill Marston is professor of literature and philosophy at the University of Bolton in the UK. She is the author of After Nietzsche, published by Palgrave, and a range of works on continental philosophy and the relationship between philosophy and literature. She's currently working on a book on Nietzsche and literary thinking. Professor Marston. Thank you. One of the things that we've been tasked to think about on this panel is how people might critically outthink negativities and pull together to live a good life. Today we might feel particularly gloomy about the prospects of a peaceful and sustainable future and feel powerless to act in a world ravaged by war and environmental and humanitarian crises. What can philosophical reflection do to change anything? we might ask. Well, my work is on the 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who had much to say about overcoming negativities. He said that the most important question in all of philosophy is what can be changed. Once this has been answered, the work of transformation and improvement of our way of life can begin. With the prescience that is disarming, Nietzsche's uncanny voice speaks to us from a 19th century world. What I relate is the history of the next two centuries, he says, the advent of nihilism. Nietzsche's spirit looks back from the future to tell the fortune of a world moving towards catastrophe. In the wake of two world wars and the wholesale transformations brought about by science, technology and industrial capitalism, Nietzsche's words reached deep into our current social reality. He was diagnosing a crisis of values and belief. He was declaring that the values that had prevailed hitherto were drawing their final consequence and that it was time to determine what value these values really had. His principal target was the perception that philosophy is all about ideas divorced from material reality. And as we know, Rationalist philosophy in the Western tradition has understood itself as separate from the world of appearances, as abstract thinking. The nihilistic, crushing evaluation that thought changes nothing in the world is the thing that needs to change. It's one of the negativities that we need to overcome. And this idea that thought is outside the world and is to be applied to social problems from an extrinsic vantage point is a remarkably pervasive one, even now. There is one sense, though, in which thought is valued in today's fast-paced global context, and that's in terms of instrumental thinking. The identification of means will efficiently achieve ends in the real world. And we're attracted to practical solutions and rightfully mistrustful of sophistry. Utility, whether social or economic seems an unquestioned good. However, the downside of this is that thought is only valued if it's hooked up to demonstrable outcomes and yields easily quantifiable solutions. This is indicative of the commodification of culture, its subordination to metrics, and the commodification of time has pushed thought further towards the dictates of efficiency which means that nuanced, long-paced ideas are increasingly replaced by slogans and sound bites. The demand for results is driven by an instrumental understanding of value, what something is good for. So to, to wrap up, my argument is simply that this understanding of value inhibits our ability to think critically. I'd ask about the value of philosophy in a more existen existential sense in everyday life. If philosophy is seen as something without obvious use value, it may appear idle, and even worse, perhaps be seen as the sole preserve of an academic, well-heeled elite. 
what is lost is the social public educational spaces in which to collectively discuss the good life and to value thought and its transformative power. So if the first step towards overcoming negativity is to value thought in a more holistic sense, the second is to recognise that philosophy is for everyone. Thank you very much. Um, up next, we have Helen Stewart. Professor Stewart is Professor of Philosophy of Mind and Action at the University of Leeds. She works on free will, philosophy of action and agency and is interested in understandings of ourselves, which place us firmly within nature, not outside of it. I'll turn things over to you, Professor Stewart. Thank you, Justin. Well, um, I think the things that I have to say resonate quite strongly with things that have already been said. What I wanted to say was that I think it's time to rediscover philosophy um, as a potential source of wisdom, uh, consolation and resilience in life. I think through its long history, philosophy has always included uh, traditions which had ambitions to offer these things. You can think of you know, Buddhism, Confucianism, Stoicism, existentialism, all, all um, traditions which uh, thought they had something to say about how life should be lived and what's more strategies to offer for understanding how we might go about um, trying to help ourselves to live in those ways. Um, but I think we have largely lost touch with um, these aspects of philosophical thinking, at least in the tradition um, which I'm most familiar with, the Anglo-American analytic tradition. Um, for, for quite a complicated mix of reasons. And so some of the reasons I think are, as it were, philosophy's own fault. Um, I think that um, philosophy, for a number of reasons, especially in the 20th century, wanted and needed to represent itself um, as a, a very abstract, very theoretical, um, very logical discipline, um, which had uh, only the barest of connections to anything one might uh, want practically to be interested in. Um, but also, I think some of the reasons have to do with larger cultural um, shifts and movements. Um, I think another thing that happened in the 20th century, um, mainly though not entirely as the result of the influence of psychoanalysis is that I think we've come to understand uh, the primary tools for dealing with things like individual pain and suffering um, as having to do with the emotional sides of ourselves. What we need to do is um, name our emotions, understand our emotions, trace them back to their sources in early childhood and so on. Um, and there has been um, a kind of shift away from the idea that anything in the in the domain of rational thought could possibly help. Um, I think also there has been uh, a much needed, don't get me wrong, a much needed critique uh, coming um, from feminism of the sort of split between rationality and emotion with rationality seen very much as masculine, uh, emotion very much as feminine. Um, that critique needed to happen. But I think what's what's the result of it has been that philosophy has been left rather sort of marooned as this kind of little island um, where rationality still predominates. But um, it feels like it could have nothing to offer except um, to sort of clever boys who might want to play games. It, it can feel, I think, to some of us as though there's nothing there. Um, that could be helpful to us in in um, in leading a, a productive life full of full of well-being. Um, but what I would like to do now is kind of put the pieces back together again. I think the time's ripe to reclaim philosophical thought um, from these pigeonholes into which it's been placed by itself and and also I think to some extent by by others. Um, uh, much of what Jill says uh, said resonated with me there that um, thinking is is huge. It's crucially important to human life. It's like moving, um, you know, to move well is is so important to feeling right in the world. And so is thinking well. And by thinking well, I don't just mean, you know, being able to spot the flaws in an argument or 
seeing where the P and Q are inconsistent or, you know, those sorts of things that our educational approaches often encourage us to favour. You know, I mean, uh, figuring out what matters, um, figuring out how to pursue it. What are the practical means of doing so? What is pointless to spend time worrying about because it's unchangeable? That's Jill's question. Um, Obviously, philosophy isn't the only resource we've got to help us to think about these matters. We must use everything we've got. But it is an extraordinarily rich vein that I think we have available to mine and which we have more or less stopped bothering to try to mine so far as I can see, at least in many of uh, the traditions of, of philosophy. And I think we need to start again. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I have questions for each of you, but rather than ask those specific questions just yet, um, I want to say something that I think brings together a, a, or ask a question or pose or some observations about what you've all said in a way brings them together because there's some really interesting relationships, I think, between what you've said. Uh, and I'll throw this out there and you can let me know what you think. Um, so on the one hand, um, we, we get from, from Jill this resistance to the instrumentalization of knowledge and thought and reflection, this idea that we should understand these things as, as in some ways at least valuable in themselves. Uh, and from Helen, we get this idea that um, we're overlooking a possible use for philosophy, a, a way in which philosophy can be instrumentalized actually towards self, uh, towards therapeutic ends uh, to, uh, to deal with um, ourselves. Um, and so I, I think that, that kind of, there, there's one kind of possible, you know, tension there. Uh, additionally, from Eva, we get this idea that um, emotions should su be supplanting rationality in a certain kind of way in our thinking about ethics, or at least taking a kind of priority. I think you said unthrown reason. Uh, uh, You're well, muted, Eva. Uh, Dethrone. De as a priority, not, you throw it as a pri right. not, okay. not get rid of it. <laughs> Fair enough, good. And uh, where, where, where Helen on the other side is, is, uh, is talking about, well, look, uh, maybe to understand uh, our, ourselves in ways that um, are typically thought to be emotional questions, we need to bring questions of belief and reason back into sort of cognitive element there, which I think is super interesting. And then on top of that, we have applied this notion of an open self. Um, the, and um, I, and I, I was curious to what extent th this notion of this open or embodied self uh, resonates with both the kinds of questions regarding emotion uh, and the questions regarding reason and uh, that we get uh, from these different point of views. So there's some sort of observations that in a way bring together, hopefully not in too procrustean a way, uh, some of the observations here. And I'm happy to open up the floor for comments from each of you. If you have them, if not, I can ask more specific questions. I have, I have some observations. <clears throat> um, I think that uh, philosophy can't heal itself quite in the way uh, that was suggested. I think that uh, what's happened to philosophy <clears throat> is a, a, um, new perspectives on our experience. And those new perspectives are not necessarily well captured in some traditional thought. Much is, but much is omitted. And so I see philosophy moving into the world by taking seriously all these other perspectives that have not necessarily been reflected in philosophy and, um, and rethinking the essential concepts that philosophy has always thought about. Could I respond to that? Please. Um, yeah, uh, I, I totally agree. Um, I know I may have made it sound as though what I had in mind was as it were just dragging things back from the past <laughs> um, and making them live again. 
Um, but you're quite right, Eva, that they are not going to live again unless we can, as it were, incorporate the perspectives um, that have newly been brought to bear on um, not just philosophy, but of course, the you know, the whole of life the perspectives of, of, of women and people of colour and the disabled and um, many, many other marginalised groups. So um, I would, you know, to- to totally agree with that. Um, I wasn't at all meaning to suggest that we should just, you know, go back and read Confucius as Confucius and um and think think no more of it. Um, you know, obviously um it has to be the case that the that the voices that have come uh, into philosophy and into cultural and um academic life more generally um need to be um need to be recognized and incorporated that's what I meant really by putting the pieces back together um that what's happened is this big destructive job I think on philosophy as it was um and now we need to pick up the pieces that still (laughs) look like they might be of some use and combine them with the with the new pieces um into it into a new whole that's quite um given the similarities between what we've been saying would we agree that a common enemy is neoliberal market driven economics and the effect that has on education the fact that so much of education is geared towards what's going to be valuable in a highly instrumentalized society and that how do we tackle tackle that uh, to be honest i'm not i'm not convinced that that a particular economic system is uniquely to blame here um but so I'm, I'm not quite. I, I, there are certain commercial pressures, for sure, and market-driven pressures that have cert, have instrumentalized education in lots of ways. Uh, and these are things uh, in the United States, for example, which are, are not just commercial pressures on individual students and their choices, and giving rise to lots of business schools, but also um, legislators who want to insist for public universities, publicly funded universities, that uh, universities are in a way, kind of job training oriented. So I, I agree that that's a problem. Uh, which particular broader economic system would be better or worse in addressing various issues with education? I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm going to withhold judgment on the condemnation of market society myself, <laughs> but maybe others have a view on that. I would say one of the main contributions to um, the negativities that we see um, and the divisions that we see and the inequality that the gaps that are growing are um, in good part due to neoliberal thought. But I think you hit on it, Clive, when you were talking about the nature of the self and how we think of ourselves uh, because neoliberalism um, takes the concept that Uh, exists already in liberalism, uh, but um, hardens it. uh, And that is the concept of the individual as self-sufficient, as uh, needing to be um, uh, prior uh, to uh, relationship. And, um, And that cuts off thinking, that cuts off Uh, thinking except in the sense of a rational, prudential thinking. Uh, It cuts off off the kinds of concern that we need uh, to to live well as a society. And that's why I see the intervention of an ethics of care as being so valuable uh, because an ethics of care cuts precisely against those kinds of uh, concepts, those kinds of uh, concepts that that isolate us uh, and divide us. May I ask you a question about that, Eva? Uh, so there's this famous quote, um, falsely attributed to Stalin, uh, to Stalin, I'm told, um, which is uh, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a, is a statistic, right? And the, the point of this quote, and some, sometimes one is the point, is to show that you, humans don't always care in the right way, actually. Mm-hmm. Certainly, we should care much more about the millions than mm-hmm. about the single. 
And so one concern about an ethics of care is that it, it spends too much, it gives too much emphasis to uh, the side of humans, which is intuitive, unreflective, um, susceptible to those kinds of errors. I think that's a, a misunderstanding of the ethics of care, um, at least where the ethics of care uh, is going um, as a, a theory to be developed. Um, I brought in this idea that we care about care. Clearly, we can care about the one much more easily than we can care about the million. But what we can care about is that the million uh, can be in situations of care, can be in relation, uh, that if we take uh, taking a value that's so important to us in our personal life and understanding its universality allows us to move out of that parochial mode. Um, that is to say, if we also combine it with other streams of thought, particularly questions of intersectionality, for example, uh, and questions of uh, uh, um, and economics. Uh, I mean, the, um, the, the other virtue of a notion of care is that it, it shows our dependence and interdependence. And to the extent that that gets highlighted, right, that brings us beyond the one and much closer to the million. Thanks. So and I, have a, I do have a question. Oh, go ahead, Helen. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, well, I guess Clive and Eva about the, the sort of relational conception of the self, which highlights our interdependence. I agree that that is a very important corrective to the liberal individual self striding alone through the landscape of life. But one thing that I worry about with, well, particularly with my students, who many of them are struggling with emotional issues, mental health issues, various kinds of pain and difficulty. Um, usually it has to be said, you know, they're, they're, they're middle class children who don't have uh, an enormous amount, you know, genuinely um, to be worried about in, in large ways. You know, they're, 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 their lives are not at stake. Their security is not at stake, at least not yet. Um, but they're nevertheless, clearly having very painful and difficult mental health struggles. And I worry that they they seem sometimes to have placed themselves in a position, you know, they, they feel to themselves like patients, like there's not much they can do. They have labels that they've been given by professionals. They're told that, you know, they're, um, they've got um, borderline personality disorder or something. And then there's a, there's a way in which some of them anyway kind of throw up their hands. I've got this thing. I, you know, I've got this diagnosis and I'm helpless. I'm helpless in the face of what I've been dealt. And I really worry about that attitude. There's a kind of loss of loss of belief in agency. And I don't mean to suggest that, you know, you, Clive, or you, Eva, have a conception of what it is to have a conception of the open self, which would make agency impossible. But I, you know, I do, I do worry that there's something about the way we are dealing with mental health that robs people of agency or, or, or makes them feel like they haven't got any. And I, I think that's a problem. Um, Eva, would you like to respond first or, sh or shall I? I? I have something ready to say to I've, that. I've been taking a lot of space, so go ahead. Okay. Um, th thank you, Helen, a, a really uh, important question. I mean, I suppose there's always the first question is, you know, is, is someone in, in the right place to reflect, to think, but um, yes. Yes. I think also so many of, of the judgments perhaps per, a person makes about themselves will depend on perhaps the, the communities that they are in, involved with, whether that's primarily a medical one, uh, perhaps judgments from certain people. And I would say one way of 
perhaps talking to them would be to say what what other communities might there be out there where there can be different conversations, different ways of acting, different ways of being, so that um, they recognize that the world can take different forms, different appearances from the mm -hmm. one they currently find themselves. And, yeah. in the, and in those new communities, they might find relationships that, that draw out their agency. So it's, it's, not, it's not just getting it from a bottle or getting it from a self-help book, but getting it from realizing that, that, that different relationships, different situations are possible. And, and these can be really um, uh, enabling and, and, and activating. That's really interesting. So it's about finding the community that draws out your ability to be to be an agent. Yeah, mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say that the um, um, thinking about um, the discussion I just heard on, uh, about Hannah Arendt, uh, that it's precisely that self, um, that reflection on self, that 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 that. Um, uh, that sense of aloneness and helplessness uh, that uh, opens us up to uh, tyrannical uh, regimes and tyrannical um, authoritarian uh, politics. Um, and uh, I, the, I think the kind of self that both Clive and I are talking about is uh, not a, a, a one that doesn't have agency agency is is yeah. important um but that also uh doesn't see all of that agency focused on the self uh yes. but right, sees the connections between that self and the others and um i think adolescence is particular adolescence and early adulthood is a particularly difficult time because you're breaking away from one set of relations, uh, your familial relations, your, your yes. parental relations, uh, and you haven't yet um, found the community. You haven't yet figured out who you are uh, in this relational sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it makes people particularly vulnerable to isolation and the, and the the sorts of things we find, and of course the pandemic just reinforced that and has created terrible mess in terms of our, yes. our psychological yes. health. And Jill, did you want to say something on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think one of the lessons that we learned from the pandemic was that we're radically interdependent, and I think this might be something that's sort of threading through some of the concerns that we've been discussing, particularly around issues of of mental health where individuals are encouraged to sort of see themselves um, as you know, suffering from a particular condition and, and they have these labels which aren't always enabling um, you know, more, more broadly the, the question might be why is it that mental health has become privatised in that way and that people see themselves uh, as you know, uh, at, at fault or lacking. Um, and, and we're really seeing it, aren't we, in the classroom now, rather than the broader question about what's wrong with the social fabric that is producing these, you know, children who should be, um, you know, have the world at their feet, you know, pr 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 producing these really damaged young people. Um, so I, I, I think this idea of the, the, the open self and, and, and recognising how one is very imbricated in these communities does take us back to a very classical notion of philosophy as a way of life, which you know, might sound very individualistic, but actually it's all about recognising one's place in the cosmos. Thank you. I feel like uh, Helen's comment on the ensuing discussion was very interesting. and. Um, there's some interesting parallels be between concerns about mental health and also uh, the nature of philosophy as, a, as an academic discipline. Uh, so, because there's this, on the, this seeming tension between awareness of problems, recognitions of problems, which we've had in, in remarkable uh, progress with in, in mental health, right? There are people who didn't, who, who in previous eras wouldn't have known that there was a, a diagnosable problem about mm -hmm. which something could be done. People have found real agency through 
medical assistance and medication here, right? It's not just, but there is also this other worry about this, these negative effects of the recognition, right? Which is that that probation of agency that, that Helen spoke about as well. And I think with philosophy too, uh, one of the things that Eva brought out with this remarkable Dewey quote uh, about the ways in which um, you know, philosophy has set aside various perspectives, different identities over time, and how today, uh, one of the ways in which philosophy is changing is by recognizing a greater amount of perspectives, greater diversity of identities that are relevant, and that's all well and good, we're understanding new problems and so on, but at the same time, there's concerns about um, the ways in which identities can be uh, calcifying or limiting in various ways. Um, and so it's, it's you know, very interesting to see this tension between the recognition of problems, but also the generation of problems that such recognition sometimes brings in some ways. Um, I would also say that I would also say that these kinds of things are very threatening, and and engender a lot of backlash, and some of the issues around identity um, are used in that way, um, rather than used as means of connection. Well, our official time has elapsed, but I'm happy to let people have a final say here uh, for the sake of posterity and because it's super interesting also. So go ahead, Clive, if you want to say something, I guess. I just wanted to ask um, a question for all of us uh, inspired by Jill's presentation, which is that you know, give, you know, arguably one of philosophy's roles is to persuade, is to change. You know, given we're all of a similar mindset, how, how do we change the minds of those people who, who don't share our view, particularly people in positions of power, what, 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 what might the most effective situations for change or the potential for change be? Was that too big a question to, to ask in the no, final no, minute? It's a good question. That's the next session. <laughs> <laughs> If, if anyone wants to comment on that, if you want to ask, please. We, we, I won't keep you for much longer because I know we all have other things to do, but if anyone wants to make a brief remark. Um, yes. Um, my brief remark is that we're not going to change it by argument alone, uh, that we're going to show uh, change it uh, by um, trying to expose our uh, dependency and interdependency and, um, and what kinds of responsibilities we have toward one another as well as toward ourselves. Um, so, um, and that that takes more than reason. And um, I think even John Stuart Mill understood that. That's a, that's a good point. Um, I, I might just briefly add that I'm not quite sure that our, our best talents are at persuasion or that even our job is at trying to convince others um, I think one of the things that philosophers are especially well suited for is um, raising problems and, and complexities and complications that, that get in the way of answers. And we're, we're better and more successful and make progress in that way, in a way that we don't see as much of the promulgation of various answers to these questions. But that might not be a very popular view. <laughs> uh, hey, we thank you all. Does anyone else want to say anything? Today? Okay. Thank you all so very much for participating. It was really nice mm -hmm. getting to know you and talk with you a bit. And if I hear anything more about where this shows up online, if it does, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. And, uh, Thank you, Justin. Perhaps I'll see you again. Thanks, Thank you everyone. everyone. It's been really enjoyable. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.